Hello there, everyone. It's Christy, and I am here with two of my patrons for our monthly hangout. I'm barely making it by the end of January. There's been a lot that's been going on this month, but we made it in. And I'm joined tonight by Matthew and Tom. Also, I wanted to let you guys know I heard from Xander, and he really wanted to be with us to talk about all the things that have been going on, but he was not able to make it for a scheduling conflict. So we're going to get right into it because um, basically we're still all living with the fallout of the inauguration and what has happened as a consequence. But let's go back a little bit in time and talk to my two supporters about their, um, well, inauguration day if you want to, and then also um, what you did associated or, you know, on the day of the Women's March. And we were going to hear from Tom about your local stuff. So did you want to start with the inauguration day first, if there's anything yeah. to say? Well, the only thing there is to say about that is that I slept through it. Um, I had, uh, for, for, for some reason, yeah, I, for some reason, Friday, last Friday was my Saturday in my head. Um, and I don't know why, but it was, but by the end, I, I wasn't even paying any attention until well after the uh, inauguration is over, uh, which I think was probably my, the best use of my time that day. <laughs> probably uh, emotionally. Yeah. Um, and then, um, the only thing that was sad about that is that had it been an actual Saturday, I would have been able to listen to old time radio on uh, Wisconsin Public Radio that night, and it wasn't. And I was um, I was unhappy because I really wanted some old time radio. And you had to back, wait another day. Back when we were uh, a democracy, uh, that was a, that would have that was nostalgic. But then the next day uh, we had a. A march in Menominee, uh, the town that I'm from, and it's about 10 miles from where I live now. They had a they had it scheduled for from 11 to 2, and for some reason I I well I overslept that too, and got into town about 12 o'clock, and I couldn't find the march, uh, so I went to where they were set up to you know the uh, where they started the march and I waited and um, after and by about 1230 or, or quarter to one the march just started coming back and I took some pictures and talked to some of them they have um, they told me that there were between two and three hundred marchers and I saw reports of two or three hundred on um, Facebook as well so out of, for a town of less than 20,000 people, that's about 1% of the population. And that's something like the percent of the population across the country that marched. Mm -hmm. um, right. uh, three and a half, four million, or maybe higher. But I thought that was pretty good for, uh, for my little town uh, in, mm -hmm. the middle of, in the middle of rural Wisconsin. Uh, we do have a university, but it's not very progressive. So. I was uh, I was quite pleased for with that. I was unhappy not to have been able to march, but on the other hand, I'm still recovering from my surgery, and I don't know if I would have been able to do the whole march. Sure. But uh, it was it was uplifting after after uh, uh, knowing what had happened, although not having watched what happened on Friday, I was um, quite uplifted to see. I mean, these people were. The people I saw were all energized. At the end of the march, they were all still energized and still positive and upbeat. It was, you know, there wasn't any, um, there wasn't any disgruntlement about, oh, geez, we had to do this because we have a fascist, fascist in charge. Uh, it was just, I, I, I went away feeling quite good, except for the part about not having made it in time. Well, you still got to, you know. Um, hear from people and and be there, you know, in the aftermath, but you know, on the day itself, and to communicate it to us as well, so that we yeah. could hear what it was like in a in a rural town, some in, you know, the the not on the coasts. Right, right. Um, uh, there was somebody, some. There was a Facebook post about uh, some, a Fox show that was talking the the Fox, the that were. 
on screen were talking about how, oh, it was the, uh, you know, this woman's march didn't know what they were, what they were doing. It was all liberal. There was, I, Joanna, um, um, there was uh, people. Um, you're not muted. I'm not? Okay, it looked like I was. I... No. No, it goes red when you are. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, and, um, and they were talking about how it was all on the coast, and the Facebook post, somebody posted under that to say, yeah, it's all these libtards that are just, there's coastal libtards that are, that are um, insane, and they don't know what, they don't, appreciate the greatness of Trump and I uh, my comment was I live in the middle of rural Wisconsin and there was there are quite a few people here who are who took part in a march too so it's not just the coast it's everybody it's or I mean, it's everywhere did you see any of the coverage around around the state where other places had marches and what their turnouts were like I don't remember anything but Madison and Madison obviously was huge. Um, I don't remember the exact amount. I think they were talking um, something like seventy or eighty thousand at least. They were saying that it, it sort of rivaled the uh, the Act uh, ten. Uh, Act ten. The well, Act, Act ten and uh, and uh, the uh, recall. All right. The, 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 the initial the initial phase of the recall sort of, there you know there was a lot of there's a lot of that going on sort of at the same time. Yeah, I mean, and that, that got like two million people activated in Wisconsin politics. You know, even though the recall wasn't successful, successful, um, it certainly got a lot of people engaged in the political process. So yeah, yeah. But and I was just actually got... reading today that um, Wisconsin is. Were you going to go mention this? Wisconsin's one of the most gerrymandered states in the in the country. Yeah, it's, was there um, just order to overturn it? I mean, to redo it? Yeah, yeah, by a federal a judge said that. Basically, he didn't dismiss it on the grounds of, like, trying to exclude any particular group. He just said, this is so obviously partisan, it's undemocratic. Yeah, because it's really bad, and Minnesota is pretty bad, too. If you take a look at our districts, the one that I'm in stretches from the border of Iowa all the way up to Canada. Yeah, yeah, there are, I mean, actually, I think the worst gerrymandered district is in a, in a democratic state, but, you know, that's not, doesn't make it any better. Oh, no, um, no, it's wrong no matter who does it. Right, and this is why we don't have moderate governments anymore, because everyone, you know, we've got these extreme districts, and the areas where the Republicans can't make inroads, they just circle around the most extreme, you know, Democrats, uh, so that they get you know, it's, I don't really think there's a lot of Democrats to the far left as much as there are Republicans to the far right. But the kinds of people that win in those districts are maybe not as, um, you know, they don't have to deal with trying to get more centrist voters. So we're less competitive. So yeah, gerrymandering is a, is a huge threat to democracy. But anyway, sorry, we were talking about um, people's experience on the, the day of the Women's March. And Tom told us about his experience in, where is it, Menominee or Menominee Falls? Oh, Tom. I'm just getting used to the mute, unmute thing. Uh, all right. Uh, oh, Menominee. I, right. you, not Menominee Falls. We, okay. We, uh, <laughs> we can, we, in the old days, before uh, zip code, we used to get a Menominee Falls mail, and we used to get um, uh, mail that had to be, it was, you know, three, three or four days late because it was forwarded through Menominee Falls, so I'm very sensitive to that. No, no, fair enough. But I'm, I'm from the Fox Valley side of the state, so I'm like, you I, know, Appleton down. I know those cities, <laughs> but yeah, no, Menominee, I E, not E E. Okay, uh, right. So, I, I'm Matthew, actually, did you want to go next, and then we'll go to Joanna? Sure. Um, I had nothing to do with inauguration day. That was a work day for me, and not that I would have participated, not that I would have made myself counted for anything dealing with Trump. Um, but I did miss get you and Steve getting together, but it looks like you two had a good time on that day. But my inauguration experience was Saturday. Now, I wasn't able to do anything with the march because I was scheduled to run sound for what was the Unity Ball in D.C., which 
was a small gathering. You know, it wasn't like the the huge balls that were official uh, inauguration balls, but this was something, a gathering. Uh, it was a fundraiser, uh, two organizations, Bread for City, as long with Planned Parenthood. Um, we had several hundred people there. We had a photo booth with a uh, Mike Pence impersonator, of someone we call Mike Hot Pence. Our Mike Pence doesn't wear pants. Um, and we raised a lot of money. We had two bands there. We had four DJs there. There were a lot of people. Everyone had fun. It was a nice little respite from the time we knew was coming when we are now dealing with Trump. So, And then, of course, to get to the venue where we were having it, it was on 7th Street, a couple blocks south from the Verizon Center, which put the venue squarely in what had been the red zone that Friday during the inauguration. I had no trouble getting through the police barrier that was a little further outside the zone. But when I got to, when I got about 200 feet away from the building, the number of marchers coming from the march was just this sea of people coming north on 7th Street towards the Verizon Center that it took me half an hour to move that 200 feet so that I could park my car and unload it and get ready for the show. It, I I had never in my life seen anything like that in D.C. personally. You know, I've seen news reports. And, of course, I had been watching the news as far as the march was concerned. And then I've heard what you and Steve went through when you were marching. And, in fact, you were seeing marchers on Independence Avenue, on Constitution Avenue, on Pennsylvania Avenue. So I was just seeing what was left of it you know, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And it was just absolutely amazing just how many people. It was just a wall of people coming up that street. Um, I can't imagine what it was like in the rest of the city. It was almost like we tripled, quadrupled the population of the city just for this event. Um, not that D.C. is has a huge population by any stretch of the imagination, but it was just so many concentrated people in one place at one time. That was absolutely amazing. There was so much energy in that city that day. And not one arrest which is absolutely amazing. Too bad we can't say the same for the inauguration itself, but uh, at, at least people were on good behavior. My my only complaint anytime there's any kind of protest, any kind of march in city is for the love of anything, please follow the traffic laws, um, which most people did, but you know, I still see people running around on streets and stuff like that. But it, Considering the number of people, it was well managed. At least people self managed themselves as they were going right. about their day. So that was amazing to see. Agreed. Yeah. And uh, uh, Joanna, how about you? I didn't really go out to any of the marches. My health really yeah. prevents me. Sure. Did you um, Did you watch it though? Was, yeah, how was the coverage? I have no idea what the – did they cover it all day long, or did they just um, talk about it at the top of the hour? I wasn't really watching the CNN coverage. They had um, things on the Young Turks for it pretty much all day, and that's what I was watching off and on, and I was watching, you know, Twitter and stuff unfold with pictures. And that was what was Twitter cool. like? Alive. <laughs> Lots of people yeah. talking signs. Lots of signs. And just your feed going mad? Yep. It's always fun to watch protest signs. People come up with such awesome stuff. Yeah, that really struck me too, because when I did the protest in London, we went down, actually, the, we went by, uh, there were enough of us to hire a coach, so we went down by bus. Mm -hmm. When we got down there, uh, there were just signs sort of waiting for us, like the, like the socialists <laughs> and made a bunch of signs for people to yep. hold up about tuition or the NHS or whatever else. They were pretty mainstream, you know, so people were willing to hold them and then just said, you know, like whatever socialist group, you know, like on the small print. But what struck me was that everyone had a homemade sign. Everyone mm -hmm. had their own message. And this is what sort of frustrates me about people who criticize the march for not being you know, focused on particular issues. This was a, a these were spontaneous expressions. So do you remember some of the signs that stick out in your mind? I really like the ones with the art and Vivian, um, my daughter's right here now. She really wants to go protesting sometime. I told her a lot of the signs too, didn't I? Mm, cool. Like, like, did you like the ones with the art or did you like the ones with the words or? Yeah, you like the ones that like had no Trump and stuff in you. 
And she also liked the ones that had like pictures of the earth and stuff on it. Really oh, yeah. Environmentalist here. Cool. So. Yeah, and of course, um, what I didn't know going into it was the whole hat thing. Yeah. Uh, that was a really, really nice thing to see whenever you were traveling around the city, you see someone in that hat and you're like, hey, you're a cool person. <laughs> yeah, I know that there was a march in Minneapolis and I can pretty much guarantee that there were probably gatherings in at least St. Cloud and, you know, Rochester and Duluth, you know, the bigger cities. I mean, And I sounds like all of them were really positive, uplifting kind of things, not yeah, angry or any arrests or anything. I mean. And that too is phenomenal. I mean, yeah, just, and I might be joking about getting our stomping boots back on, but we need more like going protesting than we do beating up people. We're a little bit too old for that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, get your marching boots on. You know, get out there yep. to, to march. Um, yeah, it's it's been for me the those signs that some of them were captured by the photographer that I met that weekend when I was still in DC and he showed me some of his photos. I was like, you have to give these to me, give these to me because I need to make a video out of these. And I don't know if you guys have ch had a chance to see it, but he's yeah, just got a- I don't know if any one particular one stuck out so much. It's just like the like volume of them. Um, and I think there was one with John Lewis that said rise on it, you know? Um, yeah. The civil rights, Senate. you know who I'm talking about. I yeah. think I got the name wrong. Uh, Congressman John Lewis? Yes. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Fibro brain, I'm sorry. No, I'm that's not. fine. You're cool. Everything's cool. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the march itself was, yeah, really yeah. phenomenal and very invigorating, you know, in terms of my energy and my con concentration and my dedication. Oh, somebody had a sign with the This is Fine Dog on it. That one stuck <laughs> out to me, too. This is Fine Dog? Yeah, you know, with the fire all around him, or he's just oh. like, this is fine. All right. I think I have not seen that meme. I'm not as hip and cool as you are. I'll have to find it and show it to you then because it's like it, the cartoonist has even done like a follow up to it where the dog gets like a fire hydrant and starts like trying to put everything out. It's like, why did I let it get this bad? What the heck? You know, that's a good this metaphor. Not okay. That's a good metaphor for a week after, you know. Yeah. What, like how we're like waking up on like Monday morning and going, oh my gosh, has it only been one full week? Yeah. What's really, really terrifying is the, um, the staff insider account that's been posting. Is that the, um, yeah, the one who's like claims to be um, someone on the inside of the White House? Yeah. And is posting, yeah. Some of that's terrifying. Well, I guess since we're at the um, the, the March day, no, 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 we're fine. We're just like, I think everyone had a chance to talk. So unless anyone else has anything to say about the Women's March. Nope, oh, that sounds like everybody. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah, so I guess the next thing is, you know, uh, the series of executive orders that have just been flowing out of the White House, which appear to be more pieces of press or propaganda or pageantry than actual government policy that's been well thought out thought out uh, experts have been consulted and and implemented in, and rolled out in a way that would be a seamless transition from one state to the next so i was wondering if you guys want to maybe each pick out an executive order if you could think of one I, i'm a politics geek so i really pay attention to this stuff but if not we can all just talk about them in general uh, and I think I started, we'll just go, keep going around. So I'm going to come to Tom, if you have anything from the last week that you want to raise and, and talk about. Uh, it's almost impossible to pick. Um, the, the most obvious one, of course, is the most recent, uh, the Muslim ban business. Um, and the, the a judge apparently, um, struck it down or or put it on hold and i was i'm looking at uh, uh, my tablet now looking at the uh, facebook feed and i see um that uh kellyanne um uh, i don't want to say the next part of the name the way i would say it um conway mm -hmm. uh, i i've heard it several different ways that make it um uh, more appropriate but less uh, family friendly uh, 
Kellyanne, um, in talking about the, uh, the the judge's order, mentioned that he was an Obama appointee, and that they were um, that that was probably you know something they could just kind of ignore. And uh, at the same at the same time, there's that kind of um, insanity going on in the White House. Um, and backing up just a little bit, I want to I want to say that I, I I think that we ought to all acknowledge uh, up front that all of these order uh, executive orders are coming from Bannon. Uh, they're they found their useful idiot with a with a hand that can write a signature in Trump, and now the. the the Republicans thought that the that the uh, that the information that they would put in front of him would come from them, from the uh, the uh, Tea Party Republican folks. It turns out that's not true. It's not coming from them. It's coming from Bannon, um, which, which is, very is scary. which is terrifying because yeah. he he is uh, he is on the one hand a Nazi and on the other hand he's expressed great. Um, great love for Lenin, the early Lenin, uh, not John, but Vladimir, um, in the um, in the sense of just bringing the whole thing down, crashing the government, crashing the, the system, and then starting over. And I think that's what he's he's doing. This is Operation Chaos. Um, but to uh, to move forward into the uh, into what you asked me about the uh, my executive order the Muslim ban business one thing that I think is um, heartening is that uh, nine or more major airports in the US have had or have made the ongoing I don't know um, demonstrations about against the ban and there uh, I lost it now but there was a, a Facebook po oh there it is Facebook post by Robert Reich uh, that shows protest protesters across the uh, country at, at airports and some of them have a thousand uh, people at them uh, 100 in Minneapolis uh, 100 in Houston 800 in Dallas thousand in Chicago Seattle San Francisco New York um, so there are a lot of uh, folks who are continuing the pressure against Trump. There's also uh, a live feed I saw just before we went on air of a protest, I believe against the Muslim ban at the uh, across the street from the White House uh, with a lot of people. I don't, you know, I, I don't know the crowd size there, but there are thousands anyway of people um, protesting the Muslim ban right by the White House. Of course, I'm not sure if Trump is there because he's. Uh, this is the weekend, and he takes weekends off. Yeah, to uh, watch himself on t television and tweet about he's it. Apparently, watching a movie right now. Yeah, that would be reasonable. But anyway, that's that's my uh, that's my. Yeah, to unpack that a little bit, I think that there's a. Oop, I'm hearing myself. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Joanna. Um, there's two things that you brought up that are both deeply concerning. Um, let me take up the constitutional question first. Well, they're both constitutional questions, I think, but the one about uh, the idea that the president would not uh, comply with his co-equal branch, the Supreme, uh, any court, be, uh, that's just, that's not how we do things here. When something is found to be, you know, uh, to have a, a temporary halt on it, the president just does not have the authority to ignore the courts and to defy their orders. This is, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how they handle this because this won't be the first time this decision is going to be challenged if they're going to continue to press it. And as more and more courts line up against him, who is going to, you know, mediate between these two branches? So that's a worst case scenario, like doomsday. I, I hope we don't go there. I hope he backs down. That's a really concerning path to even start down, in my opinion. The other one is just the complete incompetence 
of this administration to think through its policies, its implications, to consult with experts, to prepare a plan of transition, to give people notice. Some people got on a plane perfectly capable of entering the United States and the policy changed mid-flight. They landed and learned that they were going to be turned away. That is just incompetence on such a grand scale that it, it beggars belief. So, you know, on, these, on this issue of the Muslim ban, it's definitely the case that there are so many issues here we could easily get distracted. But, you know, these to me are the two that, that really are the, the key points of, of this particular executive order. So, Joanna, did you want to go next and then I'll come to Matthew? Wait, with me? Yeah, yeah. Do you want? Is it okay to go to you on this one next? Yeah, I just said that. Um, Kate said, "Go check your check your room quick." Um, yes, that's the this is fine dog, ZD. Um, concern is attempting a measure almost impossible to enforce will deepen public anger. POTUS believes people will love it. New tweet from the rogue POTUS staff like two minutes ago. Oh, okay. I'm having. Uh, is anyone else having a hard time hearing Joanna? Just so I'm going to turn your volume up a little bit because okay. I didn't hear you that well. So could you repeat that? Okay. Concern is a concern is attempting a measure that is almost impossible to enforce will deepen public anger. POTUS believes people will love it. POTUS is an idiot. Yeah, that's from that rogue account that is on yeah. Twitter. Po Unholy Trinity frustrated with POTUS idea to screen visitors for websites they frequent, noting malicious actors will just lie. Right. Doesn't seem to recognize there is no way for them to know, you know, your website. So, uh, yeah, any other thoughts on the ban? Yeah, the Muslim ban. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's actually affected a lot of people in Minnesota. Um, Al Franken, I believe Amy Klobuchar gave a speech about it earlier today. Okay. Both of them were talking about how they want to fight the un-American measure. We have one of the largest Somali populations in the country. So we have, um, I'm not sure the exact number, but there are quite a few people in Minneapolis airport right now who are in limbo, and there is a protest going on there today. Fortunately, I don't think I'll be able to make it out there, or I probably would try to go. Sure. No, I mean, yeah. I mean, you do what you can when you can. That's, yeah. that's the thing about volunteer I, activism. I have, like, I have no rides, so I can at least, I pimped it on my Facebook, so, like, I know people in the cities who probably picked up and went. Right. And the thing about that is, you know, when people talk about, um, you know, the, the ban, they're thinking of, you know, the way that it's been implemented, from my understanding, is that if you have dual citizenship, say you're both, you hold both Iranian and British citizenship, even though you're a British citizen, they'll deny you on the basis of your Iranian citizenship. Yep. There are also, I think... You know, your work permit, um, I think if you have a green card, you have to be specially considered, but there's no process yet for actually who would do the special consideration and how they would process those. So that these people are also sort of stuck. And so it's not just people coming into the country, but you have to think of all the people who have abided by the rules, the, the illegal residents who've come over here from those from those countries. They've done everything right. And now if there's a family emergency, if they leave, they might leave behind their career or their extended, you know, their, their children or yeah. whatever else, their rent, you know, their apartment, everything else. And Every we're putting them in a terrible position with no, um, with no forethought as to how it was going to, you know, really affect people's lives. Yeah. I mean, yeah, go ahead. the ban, as far as I know, um, the judge only lifted it temporarily and was only for people that were stuck in limbo. So right. I guess the people that were actually in the airports are supposed, oh, excuse me, are supposed to be getting out on a case by case basis because, you know, the order was lifted in their case, you know, just to let them get out of the airport. And that's as far as it was stopped. So it hasn't even fully been stopped. Right. I thought there was a second federal court that um, really? when the it's judge asked the government, um, can you guarantee that these 200 people, if they were returned to their home countries, would not be harmed or something along those lines? And the government, Trump's government, didn't have an answer. She's like, well, the government doesn't seem to have thought about this question, question enough. And then so she stayed the return, I think, of like 200 people. 
So that, but that I'm going from memory here. I don't have the article up in front of me, but my understanding where there were two decisions, the one you talked about, and okay. then I think the one. Um, then I'm glad that there was another one because the only one that I knew about was the one that just listed it for the people stuck at the, at the airport. I have the hiccups. <laughs> right. So, well, then maybe we'll move on to Matthew then. Um, and your thoughts, having heard everything else too, that's been said. There are so many things that Trump has done in such a short amount of time. It's surprisingly considering how competent we believed he was before uh, the election day. Um, I was just looking at the one report about his executive order against sanctuary cities and just how unenforceable it is because it says something along the line of, we're removing all funding except that mandated by law. I thought all the funding was mandated by law. I'm not sure where he's <laughs> going with this. It's an appropriations just, bill. Just like everything else, excuse me, there doesn't seem to be any thought behind the sentiment. There, He tries to go for something, shotguns it, takes out a lot of other things in the process, and a lot of this just doesn't seem to stack up as far as the legality of one layer of government talking to another layer of government. You know, they're talking about how much money the Justice Department gives to various states and counties that would be involved in this in this executive order. And just really, what effect does it have other than um, making those areas that are sanctuary cities, sanctuary counties, just more steadfast to that direction? Yeah, I, what, I'm, what amazes me overall is just the amount of defiance there is to the new president at all levels of government and all branches of government. There's just a, a significant amount of defiance to all of his orders at this point, you know, with these rogue Twitter accounts and people trying to express information that he once silenced. Uh, it, 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 at least it's somewhat heartening, um, but it's still, it's, what is the goal here? Are we talking about the actual breakdown of our government because of this? Yeah, chaos. I think someone mentioned, I think it was Tom when he was talking about Bannon. And yeah, you just break it down and then declare it needs to be completely scrapped because you've just broken it. Uh, and yeah, uh, but on um, that issue of the sanctuary cities, it's interesting a little bit that uh, what Republicans pursued well may may prevent trump from doing this if i'm remembering it correctly from a news show i saw when the federal when the uh, obamacare was initially proposed and being finalized uh, one of the things that it included was the requirement that states had to like had to expand medicaid or medicare i always get them mixed up anyway um the uh, the the states then sued saying that it was overreach basically the federal government couldn't basically say look you're not going to get this money unless you do this thing that we want and the supreme court ruled that's true the federal government can't just sort of like use its funds to leverage the states into doing things like that so even though that was what republicans wanted done at the time it might prevent you know trump from ever actually doing what he's saying because of the constitutional precedents about the federal government uh basically you know like trying to use its own funds to blackmail people blackmail states into doing certain things so it's not just like an incentive like if you do x you'll get more money it's like if you don't do this if you don't do what i want then you won't get the money so um, yeah, I guess uh, you say we've done the Muslim ban, we've done the sanctuary cities. Joanna, was there any particular executive order that you had in mind when I asked the question? Um, not particularly other than the Muslim ban. I'm also really concerned about, you know, the Bannon's wonderful statement to the press that they should keep their mouth shut. So I really did like CNN's reaction to that. And Jake Tapper's little giggle and then no. <laughs> which is the right response really yeah but uh yeah i saw that trump just called the new york times fake news he's called cnn fake news so and bannon as you noted i think is the person who referred to the press as the opposition party which is ridiculous you can you can think that there might be some liberal biases but the idea that the media is the opposition party that means that what you want to do is defeat the free press that is not consistent with a democracy. 
not at all. And you know, that's one of the pillars of democracy. So I hope the press is in an appropriate state of panic right now and is really willing to tell people what are you know what's actually going on because of it. I have to say, I saw the CNN online clips talking about the Muslim ban and how it's impacting people. One of the stories they told was of an Iraqi man who was a translator for the U.S. government, and he and his the daughter were, were already in the states, and she went to the airport on Saturday to join her husband and her child because she finally got to leave. And then they called her name up at, at the desk and said, "Sorry, you can't get on the plane. You're no longer allowed in the United States." And, and she didn't understand why. Um, so I, I kind of forgot where I was going with this because I got so caught up in the story. So I was thinking, oh yeah, the press. Yes, CNN did this very compassionate piece on this woman and her plight, very humanizing. And I thought, to what extent is this, you know, CNN sort of like, yeah, basically making sure that what we see is not just Donald Trump's side of things because he has the bully pulpit now, as it were, but actually the impact of his executive um, orders on real people's lives. And someone who, her, you know, her husband had helped our troops when they were in Iraq. And I think that also was just terrible optics for the Trump administration, that one of the first two men detained were, was a translator. Yeah, one of the first two men detained was a translator, Iraqi translator, who had gotten a special permit to travel to be in the United States because of the aid he had lend, lent our country. Yeah, and um, there's also the whole thing where he's been talking about taking Iraqi oil again. So he's actively bringing our troops overseas in danger, and that's enraged me as well. <laughs> I mean, these are, they're trying to help, you know, with mo the Battle of Mosul that's been going on for months and months and months. You know, they're there in advisory passatories for the most part. And Trump has basically painted a big boat, you know, target on their back by saying, oh, maybe we're going to take that oil. Who's going to want to work with them? He's so irresponsible with his language and what he says. He just has no concept of the consequences of what he's saying will mean life or death for some people. And I guess um, on that topic, I'm just going to remind everybody, I know it's been a very long week, but at the start of the week, besides trying to um, stop federal agencies from promoting the Affordable Care Act, one of the other things that Trump did was to sign the global gag order that basically um, uses the U.S.'s aid funds that go to uh, family health, sexual health, and family planning clinics and orders people in other countries to not talk to women about where they can obtain a legal abortion or provide them any information on abortion. Or if abortion is not legal in their country, it actually stops them from testifying on the effects of illegal abortion on the health of that country's population. That's why it's the global gag order, because they're silencing aid workers and medical professionals and experts in other countries by blackmailing them with money um, that if, if they talk about abortion or give any information about it, uh, or even spend non-US dollars on it, the US will not give them money. And what's been estimated is that over the four years of Donald Trump's administration, uh, approximately 27,000 women in the developing world will die from illegal abortions or the after effects as a direct consequence of this policy. So that is one that I'm going to, if people bring up to issues to me about why don't I talk more about helping women in the developing world and in the Muslim world. One of the things I often counter with is I don't have any political power or political influence over the government's of the Middle East. I don't even speak the same language. I'm a Western feminist, atheist. They're not going to listen to me. But I do have a way to pressure our president and to rescind the global gag order and save women's lives and save families. Because this was a decision that was written out by guys and signed by a bunch of older, rich, white guys standing around in a room who will never be impacted by this policy at all, condemning women around the world potentially, or you know, some of them, that 27,000 or so, to death. Um, and that is something I think I, I want to remind people of uh, every month, every day, every week, uh, as we go along. So that was my sore spot. Yeah, that one is also really terrible. And I was trying to argue it with my cousin. Um, and I went in going, 
you know, thinking that she was full out religious. And she's like, oh, no, no, this is all about, you know, like those federal funds going towards abortion. I'm like, federal funds don't go towards abortion. <laughs> and so anyway, I mean, all this is doing is just preventing women from finding out about health care. That's in exactly right. I mean, no federal funds. It's always been the law for a long time that taxpayer money cannot be used to fund abortion. I personally disagree. I think it's a health decision like any other medical decision, but that, I, leaving that aside, but certainly not foreign. There's, there's no money that they're sending that actually funds abortions. It's just using our money to blackmail them to not use anybody else's money to fund abortion either. Yeah. yeah. Keeps women from finding out about healthcare options because it also ends up going into birth control issues, you know? Because yeah. And this is like that wedge for the religious right to get in there and say, nope, 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 to everything. The and most important thing a woman needs can do to direct the course of her life is to control the number and timing of her children. It, women who have control over their fertility are more likely to get, to graduate from from high school, from college, from you know having a career, to having financial independence, um, to be able to because of their higher education give their head their kids a head start by teaching them at home before they yeah, start school. It's so it's a virtuous circle of empowerment. A literal health issue for some women like me, where if I were to get pregnant, it could kill me. Right. Right. And uh, I think I just saw, too, that a federal court kicked out the Texas attempt to force women who've had miscarriages or abortions to pay the funeral costs. Um, yeah, so, you know, the attacks are coming fast and swift, and this is just uh, another attempt by the pro-forced birth movement to make sure every pregnancy comes to term whether or not it's good for anybody. You know, if it's not for the women's health or if she's having an abortion because she already is maxed out financially and having another child would put her other kids at risk of falling into poverty or maybe homelessness. Yeah, no consideration to that. Sorry, I've gone on a rant. <laughs> no, it's like a very justified rant because like it's a public health issue and it's the most basic of public health issues. Yeah, definitely. And we talk about deaths from, from um, illegal or botched abortions, but there are also women who are maimed, you know, because of it as well. They might not die, but it might maim them for the rest of their lives. So, yeah, there's a lot of negativity to trying to suppress medical information from people who need it. Oh, I'm getting bummed. Let's <laughs> so, um, I can tell you something silly. Yeah, let's go for Somebody it. Somebody added Paul Ryan to the Wikipedia page for Spineless Animals. I saw that. I thought that was a pretty good joke. <laughs> like I told my mom, they're not wrong. I think the other thing, okay, so we were depressed about the, the, the um, various executive orders. But on the positive side, I'm seeing so much activity on my Facebook account and people sharing things around and, you know, expressing opinions about reacting to things. And, and I don't know if you guys also feel, have seen that kind of activity too from people that maybe aren't always as political. Um, yeah, one of my best friends is finally, like I said, put on her figure to stomping boots again, <laughs> where she's been quiet for stuff like this for a long time and it's kind of popped up again. That's good. Hey, Matthew, uh, yeah, what, uh, what were you going to say? I think my the problem for me is my Facebook page seems to be 50-50 when it comes to anti-Trump, pro-Trump. So I, there's a lot of weeds for me to wade through before I see the good stuff. Um, so I haven't really been paying attention just because I don't want to think more about the current president than I have to. So... It's it's weird to me just just how people are supporting like, again when we were talking about the executive orders and just the multitude of them that have occurred just how many people I know personally that are both in support of them which sometimes just scares me or the ones who are very active in in opposition to them which you know that's the heartening part of of it and hopefully the opposition will continue. So that's what I'm hoping for. It's just, for me, it's difficult to read my Facebook feed just because of that 
I'm seeing both sides of, I'm seeing both opinions on the issue. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so are there, are there any things like the, the general tone, I guess is maybe what I've heard, but I would assume that a lot of the posts are, this is just liberal whining. Not so much, but sort of the post about, we were talking about the executive order about not talk, not gagging people from talking about abortion or other healthcare options for women. And there are, I have a few people who are absolutely in support of that because obviously their beliefs are that these things are wrong and we can't have these as medical procedures. So they are ecstatic about the fact that Trump has managed to find a way to make it difficult to talk about these options. Wow, I'm depressed now. Well, Sorry, I, I didn't want to depress anyone. It's okay. It's okay. It's good to know what the reality is, even if it's unpleasant. Yeah, Tom. Well, a little, little history about that, though, is that when the uh, uh, when Roe v. Wade, around the time that Roe v. Wade was going to be decided, it was before that um, time, and we were the country was talking about abortion. Um, there was. This is something I don't think most people remember or, or know at all, and that's that the Southern Baptists, uh, among other, um, among another, uh, uh, a number of other religious groups, were for legal abortion, and they were for it on the basis that uh, basis of um, that abortion was going to happen whether it was legal or not, and uh, it was. Uh, in compassion for the uh, health of the women that were going that would otherwise be having unsafe abortions, uh, self-abortion or back alley, um, uh, or to going to uh, some other country that might not have the same quality of health care that we do, um, they were in favor of uh, legal abortion, limiting it, you know, limited legal abortion, but still. Uh, that's something that if I'm if that if I'm remembering that correctly, and I I've seen that several places, uh, it, it it is heartening that if we have to go through it again, there may be um, there may be support from some uh, religious religious folks that we might not might not have understood. Now, of course, religion has shifted the way to the right, so I don't know if that's going to be the same again. But there are uh, a lot of religious folks that would support uh, return to legal abortion if Roe v. Wade is uh, overturned or gutted somehow. Yeah, I think with you know the advancements of science in terms of you know like IVF, uh, if you're you know there are people who want to stop women from having IUDs, who want to stop women from using the pill, who want to stop IVF on the premise that life begins at conception and so anything that is interferes with that or even IVF if you're destroying the embryos that's you should do that um, so you know even though religion has moved to the right I think you know science has also progressed I mean maybe not there was a poll I wanted to say that came out recently I wanted to start this what I my answer with I think it was from Pew and it shows that the majority of Americans still support legal access to legal abortion and that to me just shows that you know the republicans are so extreme and so out of touch that they're trying you know they they would done these tarp bills where they basically try to regulate abortion clinics the the party against regulation tries to regulate abortion clinics out of existence and the impact of that you know they're they're so aggressive that <clears throat> excuse me um they've people are are if it feels like as you were saying you're going backwards to where women are you know, getting medication online, uh, maybe, or going to Mexico or getting drugs in from Mexico in order to get the health services that they're going to get. So, um, yeah, I'd, you know, um, hopefully we, we will never go back and, and Roe v. Wade won't be pushed back because I think that constitutional right of privacy is is too much of a precedent now and too many other cases to undo. And so I'm, I'm hoping that it's it's so now bound up with other um, court decisions that they really won't be able to 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 extract it as much as they think they would in order to force abortion uh, back down to the states. So. Yeah. Well, um, 
Okay, so uh, I, I feel like as being in charge. Oh, you've got to get going because you've got some laundry to do. All right. I've been up way too long. Okay. It was good that you were here to hang out. We appreciate it. Yep. Later, guys. See, See ya. ya. Bye bye. Yeah, so I guess, you know, just kind of looking forward, it, it feels like, you know, every day is going to be a bit of a what did Trump do today? Which is and maybe something I'll learn to dread, maybe on like, uh, you know, the, the Amazon, uh, the Google Home and stuff. You can do a new skill where you just said, what did Trump do today? And it just gets you all the latest Trump headlines so you can get it all done in one sort of Band-Aid rip of news. Just get it off all in one, one go. But there are, there are times I wish for those back in the 90s when I was in high school and college and oblivious to what was going on in government. The first time I ever really took notice of a presidential election was, uh, yeah, I knew I noticed 92, I noticed 96, but it was the 2000 election and that debacle that w was first got me to my attention as far as presidential elections. I wish I could go back to those naive times yeah. some, some days dealing with Trump. It's like, is there any part of this country where you can live where you don't have to think about what the president is doing? Uh, is is there a part of this country where the president's pen hasn't affected life in that part of the country? Uh, I, I wonder if such a place exists. Yeah, I think one thing that we might have on our side is the fact that the Republicans have no idea what to do. <laughs> yeah, the the secret. Did you guys hear about the secret tapes that got leaked out of their conference? Okay, right. So oh, somebody, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was, um, was that about Obamacare? Yeah, or there were a couple of things. Yeah. But yeah, part of it was Obamacare. And what they basically said was there is no agreement in the room on how to proceed. Because some of them are saying we need to repeal it right away. Others are saying, look, we promised people that they wouldn't lose their coverage and or we wouldn't pull the rug out from under them. And if we do it, if we do a quick repeal, we're pulling out the rug from out from under them some of some of them want to do block grants to the states some of them don't want to do that um they don't they have no clue they just have no idea what to do and they're also worried about targeting planned parenthood um you know they want to like find a way to stick it in something so that it doesn't draw so much attention and not to this reconciliation bill and they're they, yeah it was just um a really interesting insight to hear people who who pretend all the time like they know what they're talking about and just to hear them in their actual with their masks off exposing that they don't have a clue how to run this government how to fix the problem they've been complaining about for the last seven years and um yeah there was a, one other thing that i wanted to say but i had like three thoughts in my head and one of them escaped me but it, it just goes to, to show me that people because you can run a business does not mean you can run government running a business like you know, I'm sure Donald Trump can just make orders, make phone calls, and, and then people scurry to make it happen. But you can't do that as a president. You have to be able to talk to people and negotiate and administer. He's not the, you know, the decider. You know, he's the executive. He enacts things. He has to make sure they're managed properly. And I don't think he can do that. And the Republicans in Congress aren't going to help. Yeah, I've got, uh, uh, I have several places where I go do discussions. One of them is, uh, um, uh, Usenet discussion page, which is, you know, how 90s is that? Uh, but it's uh, it's an atheist page, and we get all kinds of Christians and other for other sorts there to uh, disrupt and make unhappy uh, noises. And one of the uh, discussions that's going on right now is about um, pro and con Donald Trump obviously and one of the things one of the conversations in that is about um uh why donald trump is is good and doing the right thing and and a lot of people are making the comment that you know he's 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 a businessman and he's taking care of business he's coming in and making decisions and you know and doing what uh, uh what he said he would do and I have several times commented uh, to those folks that running a business 
as a CEO, owner, you know, made, you know, maximum loss, whatever, is different from being the president, just like you were saying, and that he um, uh, he is constrained by the Constitution. And we and I have these people come back and say, yeah, but we we voted for him so that he would uh, he would do these things, and he's doing those things, so we like it. Um, it's just um, just a vast disconnect between uh, a disconnect. I don't know, but it, it, he's so con these people are so concerned uh, with getting this stuff done that they like that um, the, the 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 trappings, the fall draw that they would consider it probably of the constitutionality and the system of uh, of separation of powers is just irrelevant to them. And I don't know what to do about that. Oh, I know what you mean. Yeah, um, people who, who basically will say, you know, to, to point to how Obama used executive orders, uh, which was to write them up, to circulate them, to have departments react to them, to have public hearings, you know, to have public reaction, um, to consult attorneys, he was methodical. Now you might not have agreed with how he was, you know, his his way of using his executive authority, but Donald Trump is not doing any of that. You know, it's it's like the kid in a candy shop that you put them in charge, and the first thing they do is just start running around breaking everything open and spilling it all out to see what's inside. Oh, this goody, that goody, and making a mess of everything. Um, yeah. So no, the, what it takes to be a CEO or any other administrative or management position in a business is unlike being president. And, you know, I hear this thing about, oh, well, how Donald Trump in person, if you meet him, he's really nice and charming and he can really win people over. I think he did some uh, union guys who I think they might've been border people or whatever else, but they were kind of like, you know, or sheriffs or police officers or whatever. And they, they came away dazzled by him. But the way he keeps, you know, attacking, you know, people, um, the, the policies he, he's bringing out, I don't see how the Democrats can compromise with him. He's, he's making it very difficult, even on issues like transportation, where there might be some possibility for the two parties to come together because we like to have infrastructure that works and they like to, I guess, Donald Trump likes to build things. So maybe there's an area of, hey, you know, like the one thing we could maybe agree on. But if he keeps doing these things, the Democratic base is going to become, I think, more the progressive base, let's call them less, not the part Democratic base, but the progressive base is going to become increasingly agitated and obdurate, um, obdurant uh, and wanting to see less compromise and more resistance, not just from us, but from the people who are our representatives. And yeah, I mean, it won't really matter because I, in the Senate, we'll have to see what the Senate does if, if Mitch McConnell doesn't blow up a filibuster. But um, he's not, he said he was going to bring people together. And every single day, he's just done something to drive a wedge, you know, between people and their government or people and their fellow citizens. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, he, yeah, he's, uh, he has never had to grow up. He's a child. Um, he, uh, he surrounds himself with yes men, and uh, and uh, apparently I think some daddy figures. I think Bannon for him may be a daddy figure, um, in some ways. But one of the when you when you see him when he signed an order, executive order, he holds the damn thing up to the cameras, uh, like you know, like see what I made in in kindergarten today. Yeah, made, yeah, look what I did. Here's my I big made, signature. Wow, ga, 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 ga. I made this big, you know, I made this picture on um, finger painting today in kindergarten. And, um, and again, and he, he uh, watches TV. Apparently, he, he was on Air Force One. He was watching uh, TV while he was being interviewed by a bunch of news people. He didn't turn the TV down or off. Um, he he's he's a useful idiot mm -hmm. and he is um 
uh, I don't think that he personally is as evil as he is, as his actions are, are making him. Uh, because I don't think he understands what's going on. I, don't th I think he is so focused on how his life, you know, and how things affect him and what he wants to do and what people around him that he looks up to and uh, looks for respect and uh, approval from what they want to do. I don't think that he understands What's, uh, how, how this is harming other people. And he's got people like Kellyanne Conway, again, who was talking about the Muslim ban, and the, uh, she was asked by reporters about the uh, chaos around the world, you know, in this country, airports, and all around the world that the, the, that the Muslim ban was causing. And she said, well, it's worthwhile. You know, the, the, the good that's going to come from this is worth the uh, chaos that's going on around the world and the people that are put in danger because of it. And when you have people like that around you who essentially rubber stamp what you, what you want, where are you going to go from there? Yeah, again, maybe in a positive, a little bit of positive in our, our chat. While I was on Steve's Hangout, I mentioned the petition that was started. I think it was started today because the deadline is six months because all petitions r run for six months. And that's the 29th of May. So I'm pretty sure today being the 29th that it was set up earlier in the day. When I posted it maybe about six hours ago, it had 170,000 signatures or yeah, signatures on it. When I was in Steve's hangout, it was 420 or 430,000. And uh, I've just checked it again, and it's over 500,000 signatures now. It's uh, 564,000 plus and rising. It's just, it's going to go to uh, 565 here. So, you know, there are people reacting to this and getting engaged. What, what petition is that? Yep, so somebody petitioned the British government. Uh, it, actually, it's the UK government. It's on their UK government and parliament petitions page. Okay. It reads, petition prevent Donald Trump from making a state visit to the United Kingdom. Donald Trump should be allowed to enter the UK in his capacity as head of the US government, but he should not be invited to make an official state visit because it would cause embarrassment to Her Majesty the Queen. More details. Donald Trump's well-documented misogyny and vulgarity disqualifies him from being re received by Her Majesty the Queen or the Prince of Wales. Therefore, during the term of his presidency, Donald Trump should not be invited to the UK, uh, the United Kingdom, for an official state visit. So, uh, yeah, I got half a million signatures in a day. Yeah, I saw that, and I was uh, right about to sign it when I noticed that it was for UK citizens. <laughs> yeah. And I I'm uh, not. So. Or yeah, or a resident. Yeah. I could go over there. You could go on go on holiday, sign the petition while you're staying at the um whatever lodge, like the the days in. I don't have days in there. What do they call them? I can't remember. Well, I I, I just go to I just go to bed and breakfast in uh, Edinburgh. There you go, and log in on the Edinburgh. Wi-Fi. Edinburgh. <laughs> Sorry. Edinburgh. Yeah. Edinburgh. Yeah. <laughs> Because Edna is not important, the borough is important. Yeah, yes. Um, yeah, so that's kind of uh, inspiring. It makes me um, a little bit competitive now because the one for Donald Trump and his tax, taxes on whitehouse.gov, uh, last time I checked, only had 460,000. So I feel like as Americans, we need to um, represent our percentage of the population much better. So might have to circulate that one again later too. Well, guys, um, I know we're going to go long. We've gone about, well, like an extra 15 minutes. But was there anything else? Otherwise, I'm kind of, I guess, out of Trump things. And I hadn't really thought about other things to talk about. I had one article I think I posted oh, yeah, yeah. just before. If you don't mind taking go a few ahead. minutes to discuss that. Um, this was a Washington Post article that was talking about the title the title of the article is this is what trump voters said when asked to compare his inauguration crowd with obama's and it gets into a little bit of the psychology here um let me share that up here and basically what it is is they were talking about showing pictures of the 2009 i think they said 2009 inauguration compared to 
the inauguration this past week and how people responded as to which one was Trump's, which one was Obama's. But the interesting, more interesting part of it was that half the, sur- half the people surveyed, they just outright said, this is Trump's, this is Obama's. And they asked the question, which photo has more people? Some of these people probably understood that the image on the left was from Trump's inauguration and that the image on the right was from Obama's. But admitting that there were more people in the image on the right would mean acknowledging that more people attended Obama's inauguration. Would some people be willing to make a clearly false statement when looking directly at photographic evidence? And the answer is yes. And it gives the the numbers as to the answers to that, talking about, you know, nearly 15% were giving the wrong answers to that second question. Whereas even to the first question, which is which one's Trump, which was Obama's, 40% of Trump voters were answering that, you know, getting it wrong, which I think is amazing. And it almost is an amazing view of what's going on in the mind of not only Trump, but Trump voters as well. And I think Trump's mind is probably a psychological minefield for those people who are analysis, who are studied in that kind of field. I can't imagine what symptoms he must have to be able to constantly say the news is fake and that I have the true facts, these alternative facts. So it's just a crazy time, I, I would think. Um, if it makes you feel any better, I don't know if it will, but that, that finding didn't surprise me because I really enjoyed psychology and this study reminded me of a phenomenon that they've discovered in psychology, which has to do with peer pressure and what people are willing to, when people are, what kinds of people are willing to actually go against the crowd. The way that they ran their experiment was that they um, invited participants into a study and they would put like five people in a room. Four of them were Confederates. That meant that they were in on the study and they knew what to say and how to proceed in whatever eventuality. And what they did was they would show the group of five people a, a two lines that were clearly not equal and then ask the questions, are the lines that you're seeing the same size? And they would position the subject in the fifth position so all the Confederates could answer first. And every person who was a Confederate would say, yes, the lines are the same size. And they would all say the same thing. And quite a lot of people, not like, you know, massive numbers, probably about maybe even to what you saw, saw there, but I would have to look at the particulars of the study. But a significant number of people, knowing that, that was a, the lines were not of an equal size, would just give in and say, yeah, um, they're, they're the same size too. And so, you know, is it self-doubt? that people are experiencing or, you know, in that case, in that experiment, you know, you have, people might have different motivations, but it does set up this idea that, you know, who are you going to believe me or your lion eyes? And people are quite willing to let their eyes be overruled by something that they want to believe or feel pressured to report or say. And so that is, it is a shocking finding, you know, especially when you just look at the evidence that's right in front of your face and like, how can you seriously, how can you not see this? You know, it's, I think how people feel with creationists the same way, the same incredulity, like what, how, I don't understand how your mind works. Like how can you get from the, this being greater than this when we can clearly see it's not, but that is part of human nature. Um, yeah. It's, it's one of our, con- com- it's a form of confirmation bias. The way you described that, just uh, the quote that went through my head while you were describing that was, Raymond Shaw is the kindest, bravest, warmest, most wonderful human being I've ever known in my life. That's what I thought of. Um, the other the other article that was associated with it, there was a Slate article, and the Slate article discussed the, um, the Festinger study uh, known as When Prophecy Fails. And that I've read the book on that, and it was a fascinating read, especially for someone who looks into the way cults manage to sustain themselves despite uh, not having any foundation and evidence, and how people will go through these situations and say disconfirmation is confirmation. So we know we've known for decades that this is possible. It's just scary to see it actually happening. And I think, too, because we have maybe grown up in a nation that talks a lot about American exceptionalism. And I don't know about you guys, but I grew up 
with, you know, like schoolhouse rock and being proud of freedom of the press and proud of freedom of speech and the idea that America was a place that you could come to and you had opportunities and that, yeah, we had things that held you back. Uh, definitely there are barriers, but some people do make it and it's getting better. You know, we're better than we were in the civil rights era when we had segregation. We were better than we were in the reconstruction area. We're better than we were in the slavery area, right? So small, small progress. This lately, though, has felt more like, you know, Europe in the early 1900s. It feels like every maybe like the hundred years you get this sort of, I'm not saying it's cyclical, but I feel the rise of fascism. And I don't be, mean that by being hyperbolic. I'm talking about a government that will try to silence government employees from communicating basic facts of science to the press or calling the media fake or there's you know, the six journalists were arrested and charged with felonies during the inauguration i still don't know what they were charged with or why there's a, a lot of scary things that i remember reading about you know in the pre, in the lead up to dictatorships and when i see the way that he's throwing government into chaos and his own party won't stand up to him to protect the institutions that they swore on their oaths to defend. It makes me really worried. Yeah, I think um, I, uh, on my Facebook feed anyway, and they, I'm, I don't know how typical I am, but I see an awful lot of uh, flat statements um, just accepting the fact that we are uh, sliding into if we haven't already gotten there into fascism and uh, this is you know there, there'll be I, I, I saw today um, a list of you know what happened in fascist countries to um, slide into totalitarianism I saw a TED talk about um, uh, what how did uh, how did the German uh, democracy after World War I uh, slide into uh, Nazism and they the the, the 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 it's not a contrast it's a it's a direct comparison and I think that that's getting more and more obvious you get the Richard the, the Richard Spencer uh, business even aside from the uh, quite satisfying uh, punches um, to his head uh, which I have mixed feelings about. Um, I think lots of us have mixed feelings about that. It's yeah, like, and um, hitting's wrong, but I'm not mm, hitting. Hitting, hitting Nazi, is wrong. That's it. Like that's as far as yeah. Hitting is wrong. I'll go there. <laughs> that's. I will. I will go just the next bit, which is uh, hitting Nazis is problematic. <laughs> right. uh, I don't want to go uh, all the way either way, but. Yeah. But the, the, the thing about it is that that had uh, um, one of the things that was in that TED talk about the rise of Nazism was um, Hitler uh, was quoted as saying, what could have stopped our movement in the beginning would have been uh, had we been smashed physically, in the, you know, had we been re put down violently in the very beginning. Now, I don't think we can do that here. I don't think we should do that here, but I think we need to uh, to keep up the, uh, the, the the legal democratic pressures, uh, political and uh, and with demonstrations and petitions and um, uh, grassroots level work and building coalitions and um, do all that stuff that, that that we need to do to do what we can to smash this in, in the uh in its cradle now one one thing i wanted to bring up um was uh, I, I mean these are i'm just looking at the the top you know three or four or five articles in my facebook feed and they're this is everything i talked about has been in the, the first few uh, bits of my Facebook Facebook feed today, so this is you know just coming thick and fast. Uh, one of the things that that I that was there was talking about yesterday. Um, Trump called five different leaders around the world: Mer Merkel and Putin and several you know three others, and 
they, they showed a picture in, uh, uh, in the Oval Office when she called Merkel, the only person that was in the room was uh, General Flynn. When she called, when he called um, Putin, uh, there was Flynn and Priebus and Ryan and uh, Pence and one other person uh, from the Republican leadership. And the uh, mole, uh, the, the, the white, white house, white house, white house, white house. I like that. I'm going to use it. The White House leaker. Um, is suggesting that the reason that there were all those people in the room with the call uh, to Putin was that they want to have some kind of sense that Trump is not being blackmailed by Putin. And they uh, came away from that thinking, not being comforted that he wasn't. They're thinking that he might actually be being uh, blackmailed in, or pressured in some way by Putin with things that they that the Russians know that the um, that Trump does not want other people to know about, which is which gives me a little bit uh, just a sliver of hope that the Republicans may actually have a sense that they could go down with him if there is treason going on. Yeah, I mean, there has to be you know, these investigations, and I don't trust the Republicans. You know, um, who, who heard of Benghazi since the election? Who's heard of email, private email servers since the election? Uh, these guys don't engage in government oversight. They engage in political witch hunts. And this whole thing, if it's run by Republicans, we've seen the way that they overrun the Democrats, ISA, um, and Cummings, got into a lot of debates about um, what information should come out during the various, you know, um, uh, political witch hunts carried out against Clinton in order to, you know, basically have taxpayer funded um, opposition research conducted for you. So Republicans are really good at wasting taxpayer money on um, political witch hunts and unnecessary lawsuits because they write laws that are unconstitutional and then use taxpayer money to defend them in the courts. Anyway, I'm on a rant. Um, <laughs> What were we saying again? Your last point, Tom? Um, it's coming, again, it's coming thick and fast. I was talking about the, uh, the uh, call to Putin um, that, uh, that was witnessed by some people in the Republican leadership who, yeah. may, who are concerned about whether or not there is a potential for, um, for, uh, interference to have brought Trump in and to bring down not just Trump, but the Republicans more generally. Yeah. I think, you know, with Putin, there, if, if there is stuff that's going on, it, you know, it, the truth will out because we do have journalists in this country. And to be honest, um, other countries around the world will be interested in getting um, any information that the Russians have on America because it's to their tactical knowledge. So I think it's, um, you know, I, 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 I like to, I prefer to focus on the things that I can see and what I can see is a direct link between Putin and hacking the DNC and the RNC sitting on that little gold mine, then doctoring information, handing it over to Julius, uh, Julian Assange, who then puts it out through WikiLeaks. And after Donald Trump is elected, Assange, um, well, first says that if Chelsea Manning was pardoned, he would uh, like travel to Sweden or whatever because he was worried about US extradition. Then Obama did issue the pardon and Assange reneged on his offer or what he said he was going to do. And now he wants to, uh, he's trying to get Donald Trump to say that the U.S. won't extradite him to America if he travels to the, face these charges, I think, in, in Sweden. So, you know, I, I see the link between Putin and WikiLeaks and Trump there. I, I see a conspiracy in the FBI with Comey and his agents who were using books that were written by anti-Clinton people on the level of sort of Dinesh, Dinesh D'Souza. Oh, conspiracy, yeah, conspiracy level stuff. Jesus Christ. Whereas, you know, that MI6 agent who had information on possible compromising links between Trump's campaign and the Russian government sent that information to the FBI in the summer and they did nothing with it. So I see conspiracies, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess um, this one, and I guess this, this rogue account, I don't know it. And so until I see a post hoc verification in mainstream media outlets, right. 
I would kind of hold off. But it's if it's yeah. true, it's interesting. It also might show that the Republicans don't trust, like you said, don't trust Trump, Trump to to have a negotiation um, and either not, you know, make out some kind of deal or reveal something. Yeah. So not something that is not uh, is not a guess is that uh, is the uh, KGB, uh, former KGB, whatever their uh, intelligence agency is now, the agent that was just murdered in Moscow, who had been in contact with the MI6 agent uh, about the uh, about the, the Trump business. That's we know that happened. And the, uh, you know, it, it's almost certainly, again, who knows, but I would think that it's almost certain to have um, to be Putin cleaning up um, his end of the uh, of what went what went on to get Trump into office. Um, I think when you get enough puzzle pieces together, you know when when it looks when the puzzle is starting to look like um, a forest uh, on a sunny day with a few clouds. It's probably not um, stalactites in a cave that is going to wind up being at the very end. Uh, the picture is looking uh, fairly stable, I think, at this at this point. But that may be my my anti-Trump bias. Well, certainly, um, he thinks that the election is something that should be looked at, and on that point, at least, we agree. Although we would be emphasizing far different things in the election, like um, mm -hmm. people who are taken off the voter rolls. People who only had one voting location uh, when they live in a, in a very populous county. Uh, mm -hmm. The way that uh, IDs, you're allowed to vote if you present a concealed weapon ID permit, but you're not allowed to vote if you present a university permit. These are the kinds of questions that I want to ask on that issue. Yeah. And yeah, those kinds of tactics internally were bolstered by, I think, uh, influences externally uh, in order to shape the narrative and swing things against Clinton after, as I said, two years of taxpayer-funded uh, attack ads against her. So, right. Uh, so that's 90 minutes. You guys okay to wrap her up? Yeah, I'm definitely done with two hours worth of Trump. Oh, yeah, yeah, you had Steve's before this. Yeah, I was hoping Steve's wouldn't be so focused, but... Well, it was. Um, so I, I don't. Hopefully, hopefully we can get to a point where this is not the conversation every single day. But I'm not holding out much hope, and these next few weeks are just going to be a scary roller coaster with everything that's going on, especially just with the flat out refusal to accept what we have as tested evidence. One of the things that kind of scares me is. Is Trump going to now start bashing Neil deGrasse Tyson for his accurately, scientifically evidenced uh, views on the universe? Yeah, I think there is that, as you say, this um, bubble, this alternative facts bubble that people live in. Like if you watched, apparently if you watched Fox News the day of the Women's March, you would have no idea what was going on because they didn't cover it at all. And um, yeah, this sort of unwillingness to just admit the reality you see in front of your face. I mean, who cares if he had fewer people? He won the freaking election, guys. Stop being so whiny. <laughs> you know, the only reason that, you know, people care about this is because Trump cares about it. So these are the kinds of things that, you know, he chooses to make a stand on. You know, the, how many people attended his crowds is so bound up with his ego. And yet mm -hmm. there is a kind of level of that kind of dedication, the diehards, the people who are willing to follow what he says and defend whatever he does. And yeah, that's, um, it's, it's not something I'm used to seeing. Maybe if I had lived through the 1950s and the Red Scare, where you had really rigid, you know, ideas about what reality was supposed to be and who was supposed to think what and what communists were, whatever. But not, not in my going on 45 years do I remember someone just lying just just lying and, and, and not and, and it's like the world you know the sky doesn't fall or doesn't fall and, and it's a little bit shocking to me like but he's just lied can that are, am i going crazy am i the only one who can see it and it feels like you're you're there too matthew mm -hmm. and tom
yeah. There, the, the problem with all this is that it's easy to get um, sort of taken up with the, uh, the Trump drama because he is, um, he is a master show person. Um, he knows how to uh, craft things in, in such a way that you talk about him and the obvious stuff, uh, you know, his, his small hands, his small mess in many ways. Uh, and yet what's going on underneath is more important. And that's the Bannon business. Uh, that's where Bannon scares me because Bannon, I think, is laser focused on getting everything he possibly can done in his, in his, uh, what I'm going to say is nefarious and probably fascist agenda as quickly as possible so that people have uh, have a year and a half at least to get used to it, to have that that business be the new status quo, have the, uh, the Ministry of Propaganda under Conway and Spicer, whoever replaces Spicer because of his bad suits, um, <laughs> uh, uh, tell, you know, craft the message, craft the message so that uh, uh, his, his minions or his, his supporters on um, the voting population accept this thing as the new normal and don't um, then, uh, and then have, and, and maybe even, even defeat phys uh, mentally, emotionally wear out and defeat uh, us guys so that in two years we're just too exhausted to do the work that needs to be done to get uh, get this get his support pared down in Congress and get his get more progressive people across the country in state and local positions. Um, that's what is frightening to me because Trump Trump whether Trump stays or goes after. Bannon gets his, you know, initial uh, spate of of fascism in place uh, is probably irrelevant to Bannon and to uh, the Republican leadership. What they want is the results to continue through time. And yeah, I'm, afraid, I think... I'm afraid that that's what they're what they're looking at doing right now. You're right that, um, I mean, it's easy to look at the big shiny object, the big shiny orange object, and get focused on that. But the people that we, we can't, nobody can put pressure on Donald Trump. He's a force onto himself. He's not a rational being. He was going to do whatever is in his head at the moment. So that means that we have to put the pressure on our representatives and keep our focus on pressuring them, you know, showing up at a, a local town hall meeting or a constituency gathering and asking hard questions. And, and the other thing too, that I think really will help, especially with this next four years, it's going to be a long haul. And I saw it at the March in DC and it is our diversity. It is the fact that in, the, in those crowds of 500,000 to 600,000, whatever the final numbers were, you had environmentalists. You had people who were there who cared about reproductive um, issues. You had people there who were caring about migrant issues and, and women migrants, you know, with their issues, you know, the, being the highlight of that march. Uh, refugee issues. You've got issues of economic justice, maintaining access to health care, not access to markets where you can maybe get a tax credit to buy some catastrophic insurance, but actual health care. Because we all came together around a unifying principle that was really, we've got to take better care of each other. I think that's really what it came down to, whether it was Black Lives Matter, uh, Black Lives Matter or whoever else. The issue was, we're in this together. We've got to take care of each other and do more to look out for each other rather than being you know, the opposite building walls and closing ourselves off and arming ourselves with guns and being afraid of everybody. And in that diversity of caring about the environment and schools and union jobs, that's where we'll be able to fight our battles because they will come at us and do a scatter shot. And I don't have to catch every bullet, but if I catch two or three, 
and you catch two or three and everybody else's catches. And then, and then we end up coming together to push back so that our pushback in the form of protests or inundating offices with calls like the way that um, Senate offices have been getting flooded with calls against DeVos. If we can just find a few of these battles um, and each of us take up our own battles and push back and give as good as we get, we will keep them busy too. Trump's already had to back down on removing climate data from, from government websites. He's already had to back down from, I'm not hiring a single another, a single new federal employee. He's gonna, you know, he's got, he was handed defeat by this, this federal judge. He was basically, um, you know, tried to play chicken with the Mexican president and he got caught blinking, right? So he's already not doing a great job and having to backpedal on a lot of these things. And so if we keep up the pressure on him, then at least we won't feel so overwhelmed because it won't be us trying to fix everything that he's done. That's how I look at it anyway. Well, I agree. The problem is that that uh, what used to be, what used to dribble out of, say, W or you know Nixon's office, things like that, things that would come piecemeal, are coming just like a fire hose now, and if you if you're like me and you read your Facebook feed, uh, I just you know I'm just going down and, and clicking uh, frowny face, frowny face, frowny face for each for each art, uh, story or sad face, um, and it's it, it's you're right. We're going to need to focus on things that you know each individual person is going to have uh, a limited number of things that they want to focus on, but the news is coming at us all at once, and it's hard to uh, I find it hard to um, focus on you know to, to to put my blinders on and just focus on what's ahead of me. And I think, I think Trump and Bannon are are counting on that to wear us all out. I have to fight. I have to figure out how to deal with that in my own in my own life. Yeah, I think that's it. If it's you know um, signing a petition here or sharing information there or going to a town meeting, writing a letter, calling up the offices or visiting the offices of your local senator or going down to the state capitol, whatever it is, to get in touch with them, to let them know that your name and that you're going to be contacting them in the next four years and you're going to have a lot to say, so they should get used to hearing from you, you know, um, or however you want to do it. The fact that you're doing it, doing something is the most important thing, because if we just sit back and get angry, then that doesn't that doesn't change anything. It's, you know, the the courage of the ACLU attorneys to go and defend people who had a legal had, had legal permission to enter our country until the president just changed his mind. Um, it's the, the people who are, you know, doing the rogue accounts and putting out information undermining uh, their attempts to uh, limit, you know, to limit what their agencies can say on on in, in the issues of climate change. So, yeah, whatever little bit of activism you can do, more is always better. But there is always more to be done. So at some point you gotta like go. No, this is all I can do. <laughs> so that don't feel like you have to do everything. That's the other thing is don't burn out because four years is a long time. So you have to pace yourself. And that's the other thing too about this. I know it's like standing behind a manure spreader, right now. President Trump is the manure spreader, and the American people are the field, and he's just spraying us <laughs> down <laughs> with stuff. Um, but I think we need to up our game. And just sort of start to expect, you know, what is it? What are, like you're saying, you know, what are the themes? What's Bannon trying to do with this? Trying to see the larger picture, trying to connect things up. Um, because I think it's going to be sink or swim for the next four years. And on that happy note, <laughs> you guys. Uh, these, these are going to be strange times. That's all I can say. Yeah. yeah. On the other, on, uh, okay. Screw it. On the upside, my son just got his very first brand new car. His very first car, actually. Um, he got a uh, he he got a uh, 1919. God, I'm old. 2017 um, Subaru Impreza in a pearl 
blue. It's a beautiful car. Um, and I think he has it now. It, uh, he ordered it uh, almost two weeks ago. And, I, and he's showed pictures of it in the showroom. So I think he's got it now. But uh, I'm going to have to uh, to contact him and maybe have him come uh, drive to Menominee um, or Wheeler for the, you know for the first time ever instead of uh, me driving over to see him and then uh, have, have him come to see me in his beautiful new car and then square me around that will be <laughs> that will be fun. That does sound like fun and uh, yeah and I'm sure it will be basically a joy for everyone involved. He'll be driving the car. You'll get to check out his new car. You guys will spend some time together. It'll be fabulous. Yep. yep. And when I get my That's teeth, good. you can drive me to the uh, to the lobster place, and we can have lobster again. Yeah, because that was your last meal before your surgery, right? Yeah. And I had uh, I got my impressions, my first set of impressions for my teeth this week. So, um, and in the middle of February, I'm going to get uh, second impressions, and then they're going to make the, um, uh, there, it's a whole process. Instead of just taking the impressions and giving you the teeth, they go through a whole process of uh, two or three impressions, two or three uh, uh, model, uh, wax model um, dentures, and they adjust them in the wax, and then um, it takes like six weeks to get to the final one, final um, uh, dentures which uh, should fit very nicely I'm I'm looking forward to that Wow I didn't realize there were so so many steps to the process yeah when I I got partials at one time um, and it was just it was a one shot they took the impressions and then got the partials and they didn't fit very well and it was unpleasant and I didn't use them enough but uh, this looks like uh, there's some chance that I might actually have uh, usable teeth, which uh, I have, I'm, I have a list that I'm, you know, adding to of what I want to eat when I get my <laughs> capacity to do that eating. Right. Yeah. You're like, okay, first thing, whatever on the list, tick. Like you just go to the grocery store and just filling up your cart with things. Yeah, lobster. <laughs> lobster mostly, mostly lobster. Half a cart for lobster, and then like a few other things. Yeah. Beginning of the month half a cart of lobster then nothing else for the rest of the month but happy yeah so matthew what are you looking forward to in the week coming up uh i nothing so grand i <laughs> right now i'm working on getting ready for two shows coming up uh the fundraising show hexagon which i do every year in march which so if you're in dc please come see that um so we're we're already in the planning stage we've already had auditions and then i've got another show i'm doing afterward i've got a script here i need to read <laughs> 60 pages worth and then start working on a sound design for that so th th that's what i have coming up well but it's uh stuff you like doing right yes so that makes it happy yeah, i've got a pretty quiet week myself i'm just getting back to um having been out of the office i think i left on i think i left on a tuesday and then it was like, yeah, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, I flew back and then had another day of holiday because I'm still jet lag on the way back to Europe. I find more difficult because like last night, well, also it was a weekend, but I didn't get to bed till four in the morning, which would have been 10 o'clock on the East Coast. That's reasonable, but um, not not when you need to get up for work the next day. <laughs> so still um, basically kind of like just enjoying the, my routine. Uh, when I was in D.C., because the people I hung out with were very political, and I'm very political, and the, the people that they introduced me to were really political, I talked about politics. And then Steve and I met up, and we talked about politics, which was great. And But just, it, was, it was everyday politics, every day, everyday politics, morning, noon, and night, politics, politics. And it still feels like I'm getting away from that <laughs> intense. I don't know that I could make it in D.C., because it's just so hyper- I mean, just knowing everybody's name and the bills and the committees and the, you know, their, their legislative records and how, what year they were elected and all these kinds of things. I'm like, wow, you guys are intense. <laughs> yeah. Those of us who live near the city, we, we, we always wonder what it's like in the rest of the country. This is why I ask those questions. What is it like in the rest of the country? Because we know it's not so political anywhere else like it is here. Um, you know, most people don't know what's going on in Congress or most people only know their own 
the their own representatives that they themselves voted for whereas we know everything like i could probably rattle off a dozen senators names just because i hear them all the time because here when you're near this close to the capital city national news is your local news so right. we, we get everything it's just a totally different lifestyle than anywhere else in this country yeah like i said i felt like i had been gone for about two weeks i was so far removed from my normal life having been in the bubble that i still feel like i'm settling back into my life outside of dc it was wonderful i had a great time and the people who put me up were fantastic and the gracious gracious hosts and uh, it was a uh, i'm really grateful and yeah and um, matthew and i got to hang out to watch the packers lose together in a packer bar and he got to try deep try, deep fried cr cheese curds tom that was right. yeah so so i uh, 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 a high point a low point all at the same time yes. unless of course you're uh uh, you're a Washington football team fan or a Steelers fan or some other loser team fan. On the other hand, on the upside, Christy, and I suppose to a lesser extent, Matthew, uh, you have wonderful chocolate and pastries to look forward to. Um, not, uh, you know, 7-Eleven donuts. Uh, so I think I think there are some upsides about being back in Germany and being close to uh, a major metropolitan center. That's true. Yeah, there's the benefits of rural life and urban life and European life and American yeah. life. Yeah, and you have you have insurance that's probably going to last for a while. Uh, yeah, my 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 health insurance. Yeah. Yeah, I that's that's part of my permanent position. Like, yeah. I think I, I looked at it once just to see how much. I think it was like 280 or something a month that I pay toward my health insurance. Marks, marks or dollars? Uh, do, uh, euros. Euros, okay. Euros are a little bit oh, stronger than the that, dollar. That, that's right. You, you know, I keep forgetting that there's this whole new currency business going on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just it, since the 90s, it's okay. It's no longer new. But, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, when I, the only time I've been in, in um, a EU country, it was Scotland and they use pounds. So yeah. I just assume, and then, but before that I was in Germany and Austria. So, you know, marks and shillings would be um, what I'd be familiar with, but they don't use those anymore. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, my friends sometimes who are about my age and they'll tell stories about things that happened to them in earlier life and they will do a conversion. They'll go, oh, with so many Deutsche, so many Deutsche Marks, um, so that would be this many euros. Like, I don't know what year they're pegging that to, if that was like the last exchange rate or something in the 1970s or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, yeah, it's still like if you talk to people about the past, obviously, they'll talk about things in terms of their cost in marks, not euros yeah. at that point. Yeah, I, I think probably the biggest problem would have been uh, uh, to be in Britain when they went to the decimal uh, currency. I think that was probably, uh, I think that would have been uh, the most interesting change of work. You know, I, I learned I learned something uh, on a te television show. I think I'm pretty sure it was a British television show, but it was uh, about one of the kings of England. I want to say it was Henry the Seventh. But uh, don't quote me on that. Check your history books. He was uh, he put his uh, image on a gold coin and uh, put it into circulation. And it was called a, a sovereign because oh. it had the sovereign on it. And I had one of those moments where like a light bulb goes off. Like here's the word sovereign where they talk about in, like Dickens and novels and things about coins and then the sovereign was the name of a king i'd always known that but i never kind of put those two things mm -hmm. together and i was like oh wow that's okay that's why it makes okay that makes sense he called yeah. a sovereign because it you know had the sovereign on it. it was minted by the sovereign okay that's a sovereign um yeah anyway sorry we got off on a weird tangents uh but mm -hmm. i think i'm gonna wrap it up now so um i will give both of my patrons an opportunity to say goodbye to the audience uh matthew first say goodbye goodbye everyone tom to say goodbye goodbye, <laughs> 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 goodbye audience um, I've I'll, been, I'll be better with teeth i've been christy this has been awesome and i'll talk to you guys later on bye-bye <laughs>